Uh, David, you said that uh, at least two of the respondents that have high, you know, responded to your initial letter uh, were members of your organisation, which was then referred to, called the British Occult Society. Was that organisation a spin-off from a group called the Order of the Black Moon? And if so, could you tell us more about this group? Well, I changed... Who put it like this? <coughs> I changed the name of the British Psychic and Occult Society back in 1983. That's all in public. Mm. Because, because of controversy... Sorry. Let me say that word again. Controversy in the press. All sorts of people were claiming to be members of the society and all sorts of people at that time mm. were taking it further and challenging me to duels via the press, very rarely in person, and making all these sorts of claims against it society was really involved in black magic and satanism the society was involved in conducting satanic orgies, nude orgies that the society was involved in sacrificing cats which is absolute but it's all all of it is nonsense Slightly I kind of remember a lot of the time sometimes you refer to as the high priest of the society I, that is not a title I gave myself. Mm. It is true I was initiated into Wicca way back in 1964. Mm. I went through th three initiations and my third one, third degree initiation, did give me the status in Wicca of a high mm. priest. Yes. Um, this kind of moniker, the, the Order of the Black Moon, it's not something I've heard before. No, that was a name I was using back in Oh, back when? Oh, I can't remember. I actually formed the British Psychic and the Cold Society back in 1967. It started out with a small group of people, local people, and all of them were interested in ghosts. There weren't many members, but we used to get together and visit people, each other's houses and visit local hauntings, locations, and, well, in a few years after that the society grew in size and interest, spread by word of mouth and all that sort of thing. They used to get a newsletter and all that sort of thing. The Black Moon was more the order of the Black Moon was more a uh, confined area with a much smaller group of people that were involved in Wicca itself. Mm. But their activity, activities did not necessarily involve the wider membership of the society. Is, mm. That was your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. How long did it last as a grouping? Well, as a grouping, it lasted quite a long while. Mm. I mean, I, I was involved in Wicca until 1982 and I actually left it. Not so much left, not so much abandoned, but I became involved in other things because it was very important in Wicca to study the human psyche. That is, levels of consciousness. Mm. That's what True Wicca is all about understanding the cosmos, understanding, as I th think you mentioned earlier, the macro, the macrocosm, the microcosm, mm. the universe, the earth, and more, more importantly than that, ourselves. That was the most important thing of all, which I was struggling to understand. I mean, our relationship with the wider world, yes. so to speak. Yes, exactly. Mm our relationship to nature, our relationship in the universe, being part of the universe, being part of the cosmos, being even even being a part of other people. 
You mean it's like kind of fine consciousness. Our, our purpose is in this in this existence, yes. this sort of reality. The purpose of life, mm. the meanings of life, coming the deeper meanings of life. I'm not talking about watching soap operas on television, mm. I'm not talking about football matches, I'm talking about mysticism in its purest sense. I left Wicca in 1982. It wasn't a question of something leaving overnight. I'd given it quite a few months of dedicated thought. And I left, as please don't think, I'm not trying to be conceited. I left because I felt I'd, I'd come to the end of what it could teach me. I didn't need all the symbolism anymore. I didn't need all the ceremonies. It's true I had an altar um, up, in my, up in my flat here, in, in fact not this one. And I left it there quite simply because I was still in touch with people who were involved in Wicca, people that were involved in paganism and indeed people who were involved in a lot of other cults and sects. And they used to come to see me. I mean, I've had so many people come to see me over the years. People from exegesis, Scientology, even the Moonies, they all came to see me. Some tried to, ah, yeah, I mustn't forget the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Some tried to convert me, albeit unsuccessfully. But most important, I was trying to learn off them. That's why I entertained them. I didn't want to read about them through books or newspaper articles. I wanted to speak to people. To Those who practiced the, the yes. their various faiths. Yes, and a lot of them were very genuine. Mm. At least, I think, to be honest, without being unkind, I think a lot of them were very misguided by false doctrines. Mm. But that nevertheless didn't make me want to stop speaking to them, yeah. shunning them. So yes, I've met a lot of people years but I did actually leave Wicca in 1982 because I wanted to go further into mysticism on my own, mm. on my own terms. Your own personal journey? Yes. Mm. Rather than religion as a group activity, you wanted to next go to the next stage. That's it exactly. Your own self-discovery. Yes. Intriguingly, uh, during the course of your investigations, you found out that the stories of an apparition at Highgate Cemetery had by no means begun with the current sightings. Indeed, similar tales dated back to the Victorian era. And interestingly enough, many of them had vampiristic connotations. And one of the most common tales told at that time was of a tall man dressed in black used to disappear mysteriously through the cemetery wall. This is of course an extent extant haunting. Considering no such sightings are mentioned between this era and the nineteen sixties, why do you believe the ghost was dormant for so long? Uh, sorry, laughing. <laughs> you know I can guess I can guess who He's asking that question again. <laughs> the same person that keeps asking me about Victorian sightings. Look, Highgate Cemetery had a reputation of being haunted way back to the Victorian era, yeah? And this was before the actual cemetery was... Um... I was talking to you about the late 60s. Okay. When I said the Victorian era, I'm t the cemetery was opened in 19... Sorry, 19... Sorry, 1838. Okay. And before it was opened, an old manor house used to stand on the site. Did it have a reputation prior to the cemetery's creation? Or? That I don't know, because yeah. records are very difficult to trace to that period in time, but I do know it was repeatedly haunted. Because prior to it being a cemetery, wasn't it, uh, uh, there was a grand house there, was it Ashurst House, wasn't it? Ashurst, I believe it was Ashurst Manor. Okay. At manor House. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have accumulated, now I answered this question again in some detail, it was on a forum, I think it was to the same person. The Supernatural Forum? I believe that was the Supernatural one. World, just to make it clear. Yes, the Supernatural World. And 
I explained to that person that I was in the process, look, I'm not here to advertise my books. So I'm not even going to give you the titles. I don't see why I should. But I've written two autobiographies. I'm in the process of working on another one, which is volume three, in which I'm going to update a lot of the Highgate Cemetery material. Now I explain this to the same, I presume it's the same questioner, and said the reason I wasn't prepared to do that was because of Highgate had a lot, had a big reputation of being not so much haunted, it was the habitat of spiritualists and there was a lot of instances there dating back well before 1960. Um, I have them all on record, I found them and I said to the person, why should I disclose my sources? I mean, look, I'm an author. Mm. You wouldn't expect any author who's writing a book, as I believe that person is doing himself, I wouldn't expect him to suddenly say, I'm going to give this information to the public before my book even comes out. Mm. No, it's nonsense. You keep it for himself, and I don't blame him. But I'm keeping my own book for myself. Mm. I give my Victorian sources. And if he doesn't believe me at present, I'm afraid that's just too mm. bad. You just have to wait and see. Um, maybe you could ask us, maybe give this, give this answer to the questioner in question. In question. Uh, when was the, what was the sort of earliest date of a, of a sighting, a ghostly sighting at Highgate? That you have on, that you have, you know, from as sources said, you've obtained. As I said, they date back to um, the 19th century, early 19th century. So pretty much when the, definitely when the cemetery was already established, you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many rumours which I've dismissed or haven't been able to establish to prove, such as there used to be an old castle in, let me put this another way, Ashworth Manor House, which was where the Highgate Cemetery was, that was demolished and Highgate Cemetery was built on its grounds, in its huge gardens. Because I think where the, where the house was demolished now is St Michael's Church. I that was only part of it, yeah. yeah. And where the catacombs are was actually the... Part of the garden. The gardens. Yeah, and right, it is, it's all based on a huge great big slope which goes down, I'm not sure how far, but... I mean, isn't it? Oh, but, I mean, people know about the the, the circle of Lebanon, which yeah. was dug out into the ground, which was the inbuilt catacombs, wasn't it? Or the was inbuilt vaults. But on on bit on top is the what's remember? I suppose it's the remnants of the old level of the garden, I suppose, and the cedar tree. Yes, and they cut down into the garden mm. and made the hollowed it out. Yeah. Yes, hollowed it out when it was turned into a cemetery. Uh, but. It's very, we know the names of the people who lived in Ashworth House. There were stories around that time that I just dismiss because there's no proof of it. One of the stories was that a nobleman had been brought from Transylvania. His followers had brought him from Transylvania via, guess, what of all places? Whitney Bay. Okay. Taken him to Rushworth House and he secluded him, this nobleman, in the cellar. Why did they include him in the cellar? Because he was a vampire. They had a coffin prepared for him. Because there is a tale, isn't it, when, this, that when the Ashworth House was leased to a series of tenants. I think um, one of your colleagues actually did a record, looked through the records and couldn't find any evidence of a, of a, East, was a, um, a European nobleman. Yeah, I believe, and it's perfectly right for me to name her after permission, because she wrote a book, I believe you referred to Patsy Langley. Yes, yes. And she wrote great. that book, uh, I Get Vampire, the case book, mm. which has been selling very well on Amazon. Well done, Patsy. <laughs> no, but she did, she checked all the records, she obtained all the records, and there was no evidence of any mm. Hungarian nobleman 
I think it was from Wallachia, which is, I'm not sure where it is, is it modern Romania today? I'm not sure, but history's yeah. not that good. And I think it was alleged that it, shortly before it was demolished, it was turned into a school for boys. And there was an account, well, alleged by a certain author, that, the, uh, that there was a sighting of some figure floating around the school grounds. Oh. Huh. Has he ever given any records of that? No, not no, to my knowledge. I didn't think he would do. I mean, I presume, I presume the author was a man, right? Yes, yes. Right, okay. Say no more. There was also another, you know, rumour that a huge castle once stood on the grounds of Asher's house. Now, that is incorrect. I have done research, and it is very true an ancient castle, a medieval castle, was actually did stand in Highgate. I think it's where the the, the present golf course is now, isn't that correct? So I was told. Oh uh, yes, mm. in that vicinity. And I won't say too much more about this at the moment because that's material I'm using for my book. But there is some fairly strong historical evidence that black magic practices were being conducted at that castle, mm. quite serious and quite high up. In fact, there was an attempt to assassinate a certain king by means of black magic. You say this is coming, all this materials will be coming out in your forthcoming book, will this be your third instalment of your autobiography, yeah. this will be a separate book? No, it'll be a chapter in it, okay. on Highgate, because um, so many people are concerned apparently about the Highgate vampire. Quite honestly, I don't think it's that important. It's just one of hundreds of cases I've mm. investigated over the years. And I put, put it behind me. People keep throwing it back in my face, telling me I believe in vampires, telling me if I don't believe in vampires, I believe in psychic vampires, then telling me that I'm contradicting myself. And most of the evidence they have for saying this, ironically, has all come from information which they have read on the internet. Mm. As like I've said already, it's, it's which, kind of, uh, for those who, I suppose for many people now, an introduction to the high fate vampire case probably would be online, but I've noticed yeah. in myself it's a classic case of Chinese whispers in which yeah. stories are retold and retold and it's quite interesting, sometimes quite a, an interesting sociological point of view how you can see how stories can change, evolve. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what mm. I was trying to explain earlier, yeah. You've also suggested that Dracula author Bram Stoker himself was aware of such hauntings. However, your writings don't provide any sources for these claims to the, all the Victorian sightings either, for that matter. And Stoker is not known to have made any such claims. So where did you get this information? I got that information basically from other people, that, other authors who had investigated it. That didn't come from me mm. solely. I was repeating in good faith what I seen published in books. It's a fact that Bram Stoker almost certainly did visit Highgate Cemetery. Um, and he based his book, um, Dracula, mm. on Highgate Cemetery, it's been argued that it wasn't Highgate Cemetery, as the last resting place of one of Count Dracula's disciples. Lucy was sterner. Yeah, uh, Lucy, oh, I'm sorry I meant to say, yeah. L Lucy. Lucy was sterner. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I must have got it mixed up with something. And I believe it was really some <laughs> cemetery in Hampstead somewhere, wasn't it, rather than Highgate? Yes, well I, I'm just as confused as that, mm. about it as anybody. I mean, it's never been historically proved, it's never been historically disproved. Um, some allege that Stoke was influenced by the story of the exhumation of Elizabeth Siddle. Who was exhumed and whose red hair apparently filled the coffin. They say her body was in, uh, incorrupted. That I'm not... Yeah, that's what they say. So they claim, yeah. But it's more or less the historical fact that the coffin was opened and because her husband, whose name I can't remember at the moment, wanted to retrieve some poem, poems that he'd have buried with I think it was Rossetti, I believe. It, yeah. it was Rossetti, mm. sorry, I should know that. They opened the coffin and they got the poems back and they found that her luxurious red hair had completely filled the coffin. 
I believe they also said that her body had been un uncorrupted. It's probably not quite so strange because as was the custom then, as for most of the other people buried in Highgate Cemetery in the vaults, the coffins were lead lined, airtight. Mm. So if you open the coffin after a couple of hundred years and no air has got to it, the body would have stood little chance of decomposing and it would look much as it did in life. The hair is no problem because it's more or less been proved now medically that the hair and the nails do grow after death. I think some people explained as well in the post-mortem process, I think, when you have a corpse, I think, after rigor mortis is set in and some degree of decomposition, I think they said actually the, the skin of the, of the hands draw back, hence also given the appearance of nails growing. Yes, well, the, the and I think it said, for example, for a man with a stubbly beard or something, I said it, it appears that his hair growth because I think obviously with decomposition, I suppose that the actual corpse starts to shrink when the fluids are obviously drying up or or whatever, and so the, a lot of the hairs from the from the face will appear to be a lot larger. Yeah, or appear to be growing, give the appearance of growing. Yeah, that would quite be the case, in I mean, Elizabeth said it. No, <laughs> So I still maintain that the hair does grow after death. Was there any evidence that Bram Stoker heard any of any stories of a tall dark figure uh, being seen around the vicinity of Highgate Cemetery? I'm sure. I mean, I actually said in my book that it's very likely that Stoker heard rumours of the mm. tall dark figure dating back to Victorian times. Yeah. Which I mentioned, yeah. I can't prove it. No, no. But that's my opinion. It, this is a question that kind of relates to your organisation and um, essentially how seriously do you take these investigations according to your Len wife? Then, then. Yeah. To quote, I went with my husband and other people into Highgate Cemetery for a bit of a laugh and a joke and to look around. Most of the time it was just something silly to do after the pub was shut. We would go into the cemetery, wander around, frighten ourselves to death and come out again. Was this really the case? No, it wasn't really the case. Um, and I'm sure the person that asked that question would have read my book. In the second part mm. of my book, I explained all that. So why is asking the same question again? And I explained, look, the police tried to set me up. Well, they did set me up for three offences at Highgate Cemetery. I called my wife to court. I subpoenaed mm. her. I asked the court to subpoena her. This is all character witness? Or no, 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 much more than that, to say what was happening. Mm. And what were the three charges? There were five original oh, charges. Um, one mostly relating to desecration. One of making the markings I told you about earlier in the Corey Wright mausoleum, which I didn't do. I never in that it. case, the photographic evidence was used against you in that case. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, I was acquitted of the three main charges at Highgate Cemetery, but in the process of that case, I can't go into it, mm. and it take too long, but let me just put it this way. The police attributed statements to me that I did not make. In those days, this so-called verbal evidence was acceptable by the courts. It's not now, they've changed mm. all the laws. You have to have tape recorders, you have the right to have a solicitor present, now, considering I asked for a solicitor, and the police said they called me and they never did, considering that I never signed any of those statements, they were all supposed to be confessions from myself. Because by that period, this was 74, there'd been stories in the newspaper before that, in the news of the world, um, sadly missed. Mm. <laughs> and Sunday People and Sunday Mirror about my so-called witchcraft activities and quite frankly the police by that stage were regarding me as some sort of 
public nuisance, and they decided to throw the book at me. The only sort of make you an example to others, maybe, or you just put just it much better than mm. I could. Yeah, make me an example to deter other people and satisfy mm. public opinion, which was being stirred up right, left, and centre by certain other people that were making claims and allegations about me that I conducted nude orgies, conducted cat sacrifices, animal sacrifices, um, cursed, all the rest of it, yeah? All stirred up by the press, and then repeated by this person who was putting a lot of these press releases out himself, under aliases, mm. from this pretended to be a journalist. And it was so Peter Lord was only the beginning, you're saying? Peter Lord was only the first beginning of it. My God, he's, that particular person is still going strong today. But the police made all these claims in open court mm. and they got into the press, but the whole point is the claims to the police. Um, I can't quote, I haven't got, I've got all the transcripts mm. here, but not on my table. Um, I was supposed to say to the police, I was involved in Satanism, I was involved in black magic, I conducted nude orgies, I was a high priest of black witchcraft, you name it, they said it in, but they said all that in open court, and they said it be before a devout Christian, I use that word in quotes, mm -hmm. Christian judge, Judge Algar, who, who died a few years, well, about 10 years ago and of course it got into the press and had a really bad effect on the jury this evil David Barrett standing before the modern day Crowley basically exactly yeah so if you try to tell me that the old witchcraft trials of the middle ages died out you've only got to look what happened in my case mm. which I mentioned, I mentioned all this in my book I wrote it from the transcripts I wasn't just mm. saying it, I was proving it um, about all the lies that the police told but going back to your question about my wife she, my first wife Mary mm. she was she saw how the police were distorting all this evidence I mean originally I was she was really reports about me putting a skeleton in a car, she knew that never happened. She knew that. Mm. And all these statements I've just been describing to you briefly, she knew that wasn't true. And so she did come to court, yes, but she said the sort of things she thought were going to help me. Mm. It was her only way out, really, because I hadn't seen her. I called her to court in 74, but I hadn't seen her since we split up in 1969. Uh, but she still came to court and just tried to make out it was a laugh and a joke. It was her way of trying to get back at the police, mm. or rather help me with the police, because she saw how seriously the police were misinterpreting the case. So that's the simple answer to mm. that.